on the 11th of February 2022, an acetate of a recording of the Beatles' 1964 concert at the Hollywood Bowl sold at auction for $23,838. One of just three known to exist, the acetate contained the full 29-minute 12-song concert, cut directly from the original reel-to-reel -reel tape. Back in 1964, Capitol Records wanted to release it, but were blocked from doing so by Brian Epstein, and tracks from that recording wouldn't see the light of day until they appeared on The Beatles Live at the Hollywood Bowl album 13 years later. In this video, we'll take a look at the history of this album, including both the 1964 and 1965 concerts, as well as compare the original 1977 album with Charles Martin's 2016 remix. I'm Adrian from Polygram Auctions, and welcome to the Beatles at the Hollywood Bowl. By the time the Beatles ended their touring career at San Francisco's Candlestick Park on August the 29th, 1966, they'd played over 1,400 concerts all over the world. Apart from Live at the Star Club, Odd Tracks on Anthology, and the recent digital-only release of the Rooftop Gig, this is the only official live Beatles album. Which is surprising, because the Beatles always thought of themselves being at their best when playing live, certainly in the early days. In Hamburg, they were performing four hours a night, six nights a week. By the time they left, you could argue that they were the most experienced live rock and roll band in the world. But by August 1966, after almost three years of constant touring, they were finished. Exhausted both physically and mentally, they'd become bored with playing live. And who could blame them? But with all those live concerts under their belts, why did it take until 1977, eight years after the Rooftop gig, to release a live Beatles album? One of George Martin's initial ideas for their debut album was to record them live at the Cavern. But 1963 technology, coupled with the challenges of recording in the Cavern itself, meant that that idea was quickly dropped. But live albums in general in the early 60s were very hit and miss. Glyn Johns did the best he could with the Rolling Stones on their Got Live If You Wanted EP, and Pye did a fair job with the Kinks Live at the Kelvin Hall in 1967. The Beatles, of course, had been captured on stage at the Star Club in 1962, which although had great energy, lacked any decent sound quality. Then there were the BBC recordings, which although had decent sound quality, lacked the energy and excitement of a performance in front of a live audience. The five song set they recorded for Swedish radio in October 1963, included on Anthology 1, comes closest to combining both factors and is to date possibly their finest live officially released set. By the time they began their first North American tour in August 1964, they were the biggest band in the world and Capitol Records desperately wanted a live album. They had considered recording the group live during their first visit to the States back in February at their concert at the Carnegie Hall, but couldn't get approval from the American Federation of Musicians, the labor union which represented professional musicians in the US and Canada. But six months later, the way had been cleared and everything was set to record the Beatles on stage. And the venue they chose was the Hollywood Bowl. Opened in July 1922, the Hollywood Bowl is an impressive amphitheater set against the Hollywood Hills, with a famous Hollywood sign to the northeast. Today, it's the home of the Hollywood Bowl Orchestra and hosts hundreds of musical events each year. Back in the 1960s, it hosted concerts not only by the Beatles, but by artists including Bob Dylan, the Rolling Stones, the Beach Boys, the Doors, Eric Burden and the Animals, and Jimi Hendrix. In order to get the Beatles to the bowl, Top 40 DJ and TV host Bob Eubanks paid Epstein $25,000 out of his own pocket. His investment was well rewarded when 18,700 fans turned up on the evening of August the 23rd, 1964. Just three weeks before, on August the 1st, Capitol Records had successfully recorded the Beach Boys in concert in Sacramento. That recording had been accompanied by some mild screaming and had gone without a hitch but they clearly underestimated the task ahead of them with the Beatles. 
George Martin and Capitol Records producer Voyle Gilmore were on hand to produce the recording. But recording a rock and roll show in such a venue with only 100 watt Vox AC 30 amps in front of thousands of screaming girls was no easy task. Capitol Studio engineer Hugh Davis was at ground zero, armed with two portable Scully three-track tape recorders running at 15 inches per second. He had four reels of half-inch, one and a half mil audio tape brand recording tape, a stereo pair of linked Capital modified RCA optical compressors, and no EQ. The first problem was that three channels were just not enough to record the group. And with the noise of the screaming crowd around them, the engineers couldn't hear anything they were recording and just had to guess at the levels on their machines. Let's not forget that the Beatles had no monitors either and could barely hear themselves and often kept time just by watching Ringo's hands on the drums. But the Beatles had grown used to this situation and skillfully performed 12 songs in 29 minutes. Contrary to what some believe, there was no crowd track on the tape. It all came through the Beatles' microphones. Ringo's condenser mic over his drums being the chief culprit. So there was no chance to turn the crowd noise down later on. And spare a thought for those who were actually watching at the concert, they wouldn't have been able to hear any music at all. Capitol made five or six copies of the tape for the Beatles to listen to, but the results didn't impress anyone, and the idea of releasing it as an album was shelved. However, Capitol did use a 48-second excerpt of Twist and Shout from that recording on their 1964 documentary album, The Beatles Story. By the time the Beatles returned to the US the following year, they were on top of the world. Their first day on that 1965 American tour was the pinnacle of their live career. The Shea Stadium concert broke all records and was filmed too, the physical release of which, after 57 years, is more than overdue. This time, there were to be two concerts at the Bowl, one on Sunday the 29th of August and another the following day. In contrast to the 1964 show, which had been the fifth on their itinerary that year, they arrived at the Hollywood Bowl this time around on the back of 16 gigs in 17 days, which had also included one in Canada. This time, it was Capitol engineer Pete Abbott who set up and recorded the Sunday show but it appears that he hadn't consulted or learned anything from Hugh Davis's experience the previous year. The recording of that Sunday show was a disaster in which Paul's microphone was mute for the first four songs. Fortunately, they had a second bite of the cherry the following night on which everything worked. However, the Beatles were at this point tired, both physically and mentally, and although their performance was good, it lacked the sparkle and energy of the 1964 show. The following day, they dragged themselves to their final two shows at the Cow Palace in San Francisco, which was marred by fans breaking through the barriers. They must have really had enough there and then. Phil Spector had impressed everyone by rescuing the Get Back project, so it was no surprise that he was handed the Hollywood Bowl tapes in 1971. The reason for this is unclear, but it's likely that the head of Apple, Neil Aspinall, had asked him to do something with them for the Beatles documentary The Long and Winding Road he was working on at the time, which would later become Anthology. Spectre not only obliged by mixing them into stereo, but into four-channel quad two at the record plant in July 1971. Unfortunately, the project was put on hold and the tapes were put back on the shelf. In 1977, EMI had their hands full with punk and anarchy in the UK, and curating the Beatles back catalogue was the last thing on their list. But a new champion emerged in the form of the head of Capitol Records, Bascar Menon. Buoyed by the success of the 1976 rock and roll music album he had helped to create, Menon felt the time was right to release the Hollywood Bowl tapes. As it done with rock and roll music, Menon convinced George Martin to help knock the tapes into shape. So both the 1964 and 1965 three-channel tapes were packed up and shipped to his air studios in London. Now George Martin's idea of three-track recording wasn't Capitals. Martin's method would have been to record the band in stereo on two tracks and keep the voices separated on the third, so you could bring them up or down in the mix. But when he came to play the Hollywood Bowl three-track tapes, he found both the guitars and voices all mixed on the same tracks. But before he could begin work on the tapes, Martin's first challenge was to find a working three-track machine to play them on. They eventually located one, but that kept overheating and melting the tape. 
In the end, they managed to keep it cool by blowing air from a vacuum cleaner whilst the recordings were transferred to a 16-track tape. Martin and engineer Jeff Emmerich then set about selecting which tracks to use for the album. Of course, EQing the sound was a real challenge. Not only were the vocals mixed in with everything else on the tapes, but they were also very dry and lacking any ambiance. They fixed that by adding a kind of sound delay, which although totally artificial, made everything sound more open and gave it a more live sound. The 13 tracks they selected for the album comprised six from the 1964 concert and seven from the second 1965 show. The completed master tape was then sent back to Capitol in Hollywood, where it was mastered by Wally Traggart. After the dressing down that Capitol had received from John Lennon over the design of the rock and roll music album, Capitol were keen to have him sign off on this one and sent him samples of the outer cover, gatefold and inner sleeves to select. John liked what he saw and sent his approval via a letter to Capitol, at the bottom of which he confirmed he wanted the album title to be The Beatles Live at the Hollywood Bowl. Unfortunately for the designers, unlike the Shea Stadium tickets, the Hollywood Bowl tickets didn't have a photo of the Beatles on them. So, using the style of the Shea Stadium ticket, coupled with 1975 Hollywood Bowl shows by Joan Byers and America, they created their own. However, not only did they get the days wrong on the tickets, which were Sunday and not Saturday, the 1965 ticket should have been the one from Monday the 30th, as that was the date the recordings used on the album were made. Although the UK followed the basic outer cover design, they discarded Capitol's inner sleeve completely, substituting one of their own design, which more practically for them, showed all of the Beatles' album catalogue to date. Capitol had also designed labels to match the theme of the cover, but EMI didn't like that either, and went for this darker design. With the full weight of TV advertising behind it, the album was a huge success worldwide and became their first album in seven years to go to number one in the UK. It also topped the Japanese album chart and got to number two in the US and went on to sell one million copies worldwide. It remained on catalogue at full price in the UK until it was downgraded to EMI's Budget Music for Pleasure label in September 1984 before finally being deleted at the end of February 1985. It also appeared on vinyl in the UK as volume 26 of a mail-order double album in 1984, entitled The History of Rock, where it was coupled with a collection of oldies. And like a collection of oldies, it never made it to CD in its original form and stayed out of print for the next 30 years. Its unlikely revival came in September 2016, when it was remixed and reissued on CD to tie in with Ron Howard's Eight Days a Week film, with a vinyl edition following two months later. Giles Martin took over his father's role as producer and went to work with his team at Abbey Road remixing and extending the original album. In doing so, he bypassed the remix tape George Martin had made in 1977 and went back to the original half-inch tapes to create a completely new mix. His main job was to reduce the level of the crowd noise, which he did with the aid of new demix technology. Giles says in the sleeve notes that he compiled what he expected to be a new track listing, but his turned out to be exactly the same as the one his father made in 1977. He also had the luxury of being able to add four bonus tracks to the album, but instead of sequencing them within the original track listing, created a kind of false encore, which the Beatles never did. Personally, I feel that it would have been better to insert them into the main programme of the album and have it all end with Long Tall Sally, just like the original show would have done. Incidentally, one of the bonus tracks here, Babies in Black, had already appeared on the 1996 CD single of Real Love. That was the same performance, but had had John's entertaining introduction from the 29th show tacked onto the front of it. The version presented on the new album restored John's correct introduction from the 30th show. The results of the remix for me are mixed. Let's have a look at a few waveforms to see how the two mixes compare. Here's a comparison using the track Help. On top, we can see the recording of the original 1977 vinyl, with Giles' 2016 remix below both of which, by the way, have been levelled up to 0 dB. 
Can you notice the difference in width between the blue waveforms? The 1977 is thicker, i.e. louder, than the 2016. It's most notable on the speech in the introduction, where the 1977 disc appears the more dynamic of the two. Now let's switch to the spectrograph, which shows the strength of frequency. The lighter the colour, the stronger the sound at that frequency, from 20,000 Hz at the top to 100 Hz at the bottom. The 1977 disc is a bit of a mess in this respect, but if I switch to the 2016, many of the frequencies become more discernible and more defined. Giles's demixing succeeded in removing some of the screaming and added more low into the bass and drums. But I think that was at the expense of the vocals, which seem more buried in the mix. I think George Martin's mix balanced them better. But that's just my opinion. Let me know what you think about this mix in the comments. But this album shouldn't be judged on sound quality alone. It's all about the performance. You don't need expensive equipment to enjoy it. The excitement and energy comes through on any device. Listening to these performances and hearing what an amazing live band they were, you can understand why Paul McCartney wanted to get them back on the road in 1969. Maybe if they quit touring at the end of 1965, they might have been more willing to return to it later on. Who knows? Like many of you, I was disappointed that Apple didn't include the rooftop gig in the recent Get Back box set. So all we can do is hope that Apple gives more attention to releasing live material in the future. I hope you enjoyed looking at this incredible album with me and that you'll like and subscribe if you want to see me do some more. But that's all for this time, so I'll say bye for now and thanks for watching.